that before and you go, well, how do I get to the events? There's in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little thing to push and it will come up and you'll see events and push it. And then you'll see listed the churches in the area that are using you version. Hey, we were number one. So push Cedars Church on the top and you'll get there. Okay. Now, we're going to go into our message, and if you have version, what you might notice is that the name of the sermon is slightly different from the name that's going to be showing up here in just a second. Now, I don't have Jeff's equipment, so I don't control anything. The back will control for me. But if you see in the upper left corner, key attitudes of effective church members, if you have version, it says key attitudes of highly effective church members. Now, who out there can tell me what book inspired this title? Ding, 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 ding. He gets the prize, okay? The seven habits of highly effective people. We, we just finished last month talking about church membership. And so I thought, well, as I looked at this passage, I just replaced people with church members, right? So we we want to look at the key attitudes of highly effective church members. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about why I picked this verse. Now, at our last elders meeting, Jeff goes, well, I want one of you elders to speak. There was silence in the room. (laughs) And being the fool I am, I said, I'll do it. Okay, I've done it before, so I, I can do that. But as I was reflecting on what passage to use, because he basically said, anything you want. Oh, that's a dangerous thing to say to me, anything you want. But I reflected back on something that happened 44 years ago. I was 19 years old. At the end of my sophomore year at San Jose Bible College, and I was taking a homiletics class. And that's the class where you learn how to prepare and deliver a sermon. And after a few weeks of talking about how to do it, He passed around a hat, a literal hat. It was a top hat, in fact, with slips of paper in it. And we all had to draw one. Guess what was on the slip of paper? Bible verses. And mine was, you've got to know this. Mine was 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. And that's why, why I decided to pick it. What's interesting to me is, the person I was then is definitely different than the person I'm at, I, I am now, right? A 19-year-old sophomore, extremely shy, and a 60-year-old man, still kind of shy, but learning how to deal with things as they come up, right? How I see things might be a little different, but the scripture is the same. And I think Peter was sort of in the same boat. Remember, as a disciple around 30 years old, How would you describe Peter? He was kind of what? Shoot first, can ask questions later? Stick the foot in the mouth first and then try to talk? You know, he he was that kind of go-getter, but then all of a sudden realized maybe I should have thought through something beforehand. But when you look at 1 and 2 Peter, written probably when he was maybe a couple years older than I am, from Rome to Asia Minor where they were experiencing huge persecution, Peter has some great advice to give to them because he's experienced a lot of the grace and glory of Christ Jesus in his life. He's mellowed out after over all the years, but he also comes with a a wisdom that's so important. And I just encourage you, sometimes 1 and 2 Peter get overlooked for the the writings of Paul. There are some great things. In fact, as, as I read through all of 1 and 2 Peter this week several times, so many verses that were familiar to me, were listed right there in First and Second Peter. Great stuff. Now, as Peter's talking, he does give advice to us as individual Christians, but really, he wants to help the church become effective. He wants to tell us, how do we individually come together to make an effective church? So let's look first at First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, I'm going to move this. I don't know if, if, if Jeff didn't want me to walk over here by his podium, but I'm going, to, I'm going to use it. So you can just tell him I moved his thing. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house 
to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Now, last week, Jeff talked about a similar metaphor that is used talking about us as Christians in a church, and that was the body, right? Remember, he talked about how we have different pieces of the body, and all those pieces are necessary to have the body function correctly. In fact, the, the section there in, in Corinthians talks about, well, the head can't take, say to the foot, I don't need you because, you know, I do all the thinking and then try to walk somewhere. That's just not going to work. We, we need each other. And Peter talks about this as we are living stones being built upon each other. And, and that means that we're dependent upon one another. We need one another in order to build up this organism that God was producing for them. And so he says that you as the living stones are being built together. And then just after this, he talks about how Christ is the cornerstone, that everything depends upon him, but that we depend upon each other. And then he says in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I'm waiting for it to go. Okay, there we go. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, of course, he's talking to a lot of Gentiles at this position, you know, and they're in Asia Minor and saying basically, You know, the Jews, we thought of ourselves as we were the people, the race, the ones that God called. And the rest of you, not so much. Peter's reminding them, we are all one people through Christ. And we are brought together as one people, as the holy nation of God, to bring forth his message to our world. So you can see how Peter starts off this letter referring to the whole church and how we work and operate together. And then as we get to um, the next verses, he starts to talk about things or attitudes that we can now possess that will help that work effectively. So let's look at, at the first verse of our section, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He starts off, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. I want to concentrate on that first phrase. The end of all things is at hand. You can imagine as a 19-year-old sophomore, me thinking in terms of the end of all things being at hand. Not so much, right? Hey, my whole life's in front of me, you know, so I had to really think about that. But now, as a 60-something-year-old man, I'm recognizing that my end is coming not too far in the future. But some people, when they looked at this, said, oh, poor Peter. Poor Peter. He got that wrong. He got caught up in the hysteria like the Thessalonians did, where they thought, well, Jesus is going to come back, you know, any moment. In fact, Paul had to write to the Thessalonians, and I'm going to paraphrase. This is the Ray paraphrase of what Paul said to the Thessalonian church, okay? He basically said, dudes, get off your rears and get back to work. You don't know when Christ is coming back. You need to get going and do the work that's there for you. So that's my paraphrase of what he said. But basically what was happening was people were expecting Christ to return in their lifetime, and they said, well, why do I want to go to work? (laughs) He's coming back, you know? I'll just wait it out. But that's not at all what Peter had in mind at this point in time. In fact, in the second epistle, he has to answer this question because I think people were asking him, what do you mean about this end of all things? So he's talking, and let's look at, at 2 Peter Let me find it. Chapter 3, verse 4. And he's talking about the scoffers just before this and what the scoffers are saying. And this is what they say. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, 
things are just keep on going along. What do you mean we're at the end? Then he says in verses 8 and 9, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the, day, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So we do see that Peter wasn't caught up in this hysteria, thinking, well, Christ is coming back immediately in my life, obviously, but was reminding them that, no, we have an expectancy to Christ's return, but it's not necessarily immediate. And that what God is doing is doing what he can do to try to save the most. So, so what does he really mean by this? Now, now Peter was a, a student of the word as a, as a good Jew. And so he might have recalled Psalm 39, 4, which says, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days, lest me know how fleeting I am. James kind of says the same thing in James 4:14. 4, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And actually, just a couple of chapters before, Peter himself said, All flesh is like grass, and its glory is the flower, but the flower falls and the grass withers. So for all of us, we recognize, you know, this is true about the end could be coming at any time. And the attitude that we really have is not one of fatalism saying, well, it's going to come anyway, so it doesn't matter what I do, but it's going to come, and I need to be involved in the work of God now. That I can't wait, put everything off and wait. I need to be about the Lord's business now and making use of every opportunity that's before me. You know, the first time that I really had this happen strong it's January 28th, 1986. At that point in time, I was working with another gentleman. We were sort of co-leading a youth group that, that basically built up to over 50 students. Sometimes we'd go off to, to uh, Lake Tahoe, and we had 75 once attend. And, and you can imagine what that's like, trying to herd 75 high school students to do anything that you want them to do. It's, it's a lot of fun. But I was more the teacher, administrator. Burdett, he was the fun guy. He was the activities guy. He had that personality. But that changed on that day, January 28th, 1986. You see, Burdett was an engineer at NASA Ames Space Research Center. And he was on the space shuttle program. And that was the day that the Challenger exploded 76 seconds into its flight. Now. I could see what happened to him and, and how he felt at that point. In fact, later he would tell me that his team had warned their supervisor that the cold may cause a problem. And as they investigated, they found that the physical problem was the O-rings that had become so cold and brittle that it, gases were brought out and blew up the external tank. It was a hard time for him. And, and though he got back his spunk, you know, I really was affected by that, and I thought about this verse. In fact, I actually thought about the sermon I gave and said, now I know a little bit more about what Peter meant. A couple years later, I, I got a call from Burdett's wife to let me know that, that he was in an accident on his way to work and, and died in his accident, leaving behind his wife and two small children. That also affected me. It was something that was close to me, and I recognize, hey, I have to have that attitude that my end could come at any time. Am I doing what God wants me to do? That's the first attitude that Peter talks about here. But the second part of that phrase, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, because of the fact that we don't know when our end's coming, because of the fact that we, our life is really fleeting in that respect, he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, I want to flip to the New American Standard Bible because that was the one that I used 44 years ago. And I think there's a couple things that are interesting about that. So if we put that up there, it says, the end of all things is near. 
Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So that sounds very similar, right? But, but what I like about that is that sound judgment area. Sound judgment. That word that gets translated sound judgment or above in the ESV as self-controlled is used six times in the Bible. And two of them are diff- two different gospels that, that talk about the same event. Remember the demon-possessed man that Jesus healed? You, you know the one who just didn't like to wear clothes. He's running around naked in the graveyard. They tried to chain him up, and I don't know if they tried to chain him up for his own benefit or for their benefit because they were so afraid, but he would break the chains. I mean, this was somebody you didn't want to run into in the middle of the street. You just, you try to avoid that person at all costs. Well, as Jesus came and, and healed him, people came from the city. Remember what they said? They came there and they said, whoa, whoa, look, isn't that the, the crazy guy from the, the graveyard? He's sitting clothed, which was kind of unusual for him, but in his right mind, in a sound mind. He wasn't being crazy, uncontrolled. He actually was speaking words that made sense. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And so Peter uses that same word here to say, really, one of the attitudes we need to have is one that where we are, yes, self-controlled. We're controlled. that we, We're not imbibed with those passions that make us go down crazy roads, but that we have a sound mind. In fact, literally in the Greek, it means saved mind. That our mind is now functioning as God intended it to so we can see things the way they really are. Not the way the world says they are, not the way sometimes our fears say they are, but the way God shows us they really are. And on top of that, then, he says that we did have a sober spirit, or in the case of the ESV, it said a sober mind, or be sober-minded. And the idea here is, is that what we need to do is be, we have a lack of any kind of things that intoxicate us that influence us toward the things that are away from God. In other words, we're being influenced by God and his ways, not by other things, our own passions and desires, or or the world system and what it says we need to do, or the influence of Satan out there who wants to drive us into different directions, that we see things soberly as they really are. That's another important attitude we need to have. And he says, especially in the the New American Standard, it's for the purpose of prayer. Now, now when I first looked at this, I was thinking in terms of, well, we need to pray in order to get these things. And I think that's true. But what he's saying is, as we come to God with that sober mind, thinking clearly, we're able to have communion with God in a way we can't otherwise because we see God for who he is, we understand what he's saying to us, and we can commune with him. You know, it's like what Paul experienced when Jesus would leave the group and go out to a solitary place, what? To pray early in the morning. Why did he do that? It wasn't so he could just say, God bless Peter and God bless Paul. And well, he didn't know Paul at that point, right? Well, God, it was that he was now spending time with God, communing with him, having that that deep connection. And, And as we have that attitude that we really want to seek the truth of what God says, and he's given a scripture to really start to see what truth really is, we understand God and we become closer to him. And guess what happens? It's a cycle. As we can become closer to God, as we spend more time in prayer and in his presence, our minds can think even clearer. And so the more that we do it, the more that we can do it. The more that we actually see the things the way God intends us to see them. So the next phrase, starting in verses 8 and 9, says, now that we're right with God and we're communicating with God and we're allowing him to flow through us, what should we do about all these other people that are sitting in the pews, or not pews, but the chairs around us, right? You can tell I came from old churches. I still think pews in my head. It says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, or the word also means fervently. 
Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to another, one another. And, I, and sometimes I want to erase that last part without grumbling. Yeah. It's like when you invite people over to your house, you, you don't give them wine. I mean, you don't give them whining. You give them yourself, right? So, so here's some, another attitude we need to have. And it starts off with love. Above all, kind of reminiscent of 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. And the other thing he says there in 1 Corinthians 13 is what? Love does not, fill in the blank, keep a record of wrong or an account of your wrong, right? So here he's saying, hey, love really covers over those things. That doesn't mean when you see a brother or sister in sin and, and they're just destroying their life, it doesn't mean you say, well, I'm just going to cover that over and not look at it. Because other scripture tells us, hey, our love should be so much that we can go to them and to help them, not in an attitude of judgment, but in an attitude of love to help them overcome that. But what this is really talking about, you know, there's sometimes people irritate you. I, I, you probably not you. It's probably just me. But sometimes they just do stuff that just kind of grates on you. Now, I, I know in having done some, some marriage counseling that those wonderful little cute little things that your spouse did before you got married, you just love them to death, right? Later, guess what? They're going to irritate you to death. What he says here is that, you know, we, we're a group of people, and whenever you have more than one person, guess what? You're going to have some irritations. You're going to feel like getting a little offended. And he says, you know, real love that's fervent pushes those little things away, doesn't take up the offense. You know, Wayne Grudem, I, I love a lot of his writings. We use his book in the theology program, his big, huge, systematic theology book. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. But he was saying something like, you know, when you have real love, you don't even see those little offenses. Yeah, they, they kind of are on the peripheral, but you go, oh, I don't, I don't need to deal with it. Ah, oh, don't worry about that. But when you don't have that kind of love, every little thing gets interpreted incorrectly. You go, oh, they did that just to spite me. They said that just to get my goat. And that's one of the things that really happens in a marriage at times. That I had done divorce uh, counseling or divorce care groups I ran for a couple years. And, and it, can, it was always the same as that, well, that person, they always did those things to get at me when they probably weren't thinking about you at all, right? Don't take the offense. There's a great book, and I talk a lot about books. If you've read every book that I said, oh, this is a great book, you'd be spending more time reading than you could ever imagine, right? But the, the book is called The Bait of Satan. And in it, what he says is, those little offenses are really Satan's bait to get you to step into his trap. Because once you start feeling that little bit of resentment, that offense kind of takes hold. It turns into bitterness. And when bitterness comes out there, guess what? It just destroys your relationships. It tears you apart. Satan wants to control you. He wants to make you ineffective when it comes to your Christian walk and especially your walk with your brothers and sisters. Don't take the offense. In fact, what we really need to be doing is forgiving one another as Christ forgave us. Oh boy, that, that lesson on forgiveness in the divorce care ministry was the hardest lesson that I had to help people get through. Because they would say, wait a minute, you don't know what they did to me. Guess what? I knew what they did to you because you've been talking about it ever since the first class. What you don't understand is that by not forgiving them, you were letting them control you. They were controlling your thoughts and emotions. They were eliminating what you could do because you were just still stuck there. You know, the same with Satan. I, I, I thought about this in the past that, you know, when, when Satan's got a little bit of hold on me, I get angry because I start to realize he's controlling me. I, I don't need to take that bait because... Guess what? It's going to lead me to having him be my master rather than the Lord be my master. Forgiveness is such an important aspect. Jesus even said, as you forgive others, 
God will forgive you. Now, there's a problem with that verse in the respect that we have to really know what that means, and maybe someday I'll talk more about that, right? Because our forgiveness is not dependent upon our actions, but upon what Christ did and our acceptance of it. But how can you feel forgiven when you can't forgive others? Gwen and I are going to be leading a group in September called Total Forgiveness. We, we actually did this class before for our small group. And in it, we help people to go through the process of what is total forgiveness? How do I get forgiven? How do I forgive other people? How do I feel forgiven? And so if you're having problems with that, that might be something to look up when you look at the Cedars groups that are coming up. Go talk a little bit about that and where that will be. There we go. Show hospitality without grumbling. That's another aspect of the love, is that we think about other people ahead of ourselves, and we move toward helping other people, being open to that without grumbling. Now, the idea of forgiveness, there's, there's a real problem, and I want to point out in just one chapter later in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. 1 Peter 5, and 8, this is what Peter says. says, be sober-minded. That's the same type word that he just used before. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. But basically, he says, the devil is prowling around. He's setting those traps for you. Don't step into them. Resist him. In fact, he says, resist, and he will flee from you. That's what we want to do. Let's move on to the next section. So now that we've talked about having that establishment relationship with God stronger because of how we think and act and our feelings are aligned with him, we talk about how we treat each other with love and forgiveness, being hospitable to one another, he goes on to then talk about gifts. He says in 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, I want to flip to the New American Standard again, like I did, because here he says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And I want to point out the first part was that special gift. It's actually the same word that Paul uses that that Jeff talked about last week so wonderfully. That was the sermon. I, I didn't get to hear it live, but I watched it on YouTube. Guess what? All the sermons are on YouTube. If you haven't heard that one, go and get that one. That was a really good one. Because he talked about these, these basically the the gifts that the Spirit gives to us, the spiritual gifts. And and there they talk a lot lot about a lot of them. And that was really good. Here he says, as you've received, as each one has received a spiritual gift. Did you know that? Did you know that you have received a spiritual gift? Maybe even two of them. Have you unpacked your spiritual gift? Are you using your spiritual gift? You actually have it, that God has given you certain abilities, pushed you in a certain direction for the sake, as Jeff talked about last week, building up the body. And if you're not doing your part, guess what? There's a hole. There's an emptiness there. So it says, as we've received it, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's manifold grace of God, or varied grace of God. The word manifold, I love that because what it really means out there is that it's a multicolored grace of God. There's so many different pieces of that in different ways. It's just so beautiful. He actually uh, talked about last week a verse that had manifold in it in Ephesians 3.10. It says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So in one place, it's manifold grace of God. Here, it's the manifold wisdom of God. And actually, in verse 310, it's not talking about somehow the spiritual forces out there, but those who are in authority, and it could be the political authority, or it could be the religious authority, or whatever, they will see God's wonderful wisdom because the church is acting the way the church should act. See the importance of that? Each one of us is a piece of that. And if we're all functioning as the pieces that we're supposed to be, the church becomes the light for the world. The city set on a hill, as Jesus talked about. He goes on in 1 Peter 4, 11, it says, Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves 
as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. In other words, whatever gift you have, and here he only talks about two of them, even though I think they, they cover a lot of the gifts that are talked about in 1 Corinthians. He says, do it because God has supplied you with that gift. Now, it's not a magical gift. It's not like the man who, who after the doctor repaired his hands, he, he had hurt them and he's got them all bandaged. And the man says, doctor, when you remove the bandages, will I be able to play the piano? And the doctor says, yes, you will. He said, great, because I never could before. It's not like that. I found out actually... God called me to, to teach and, and, and to preach in different avenues. But I'll tell you, the first sermon I preached outside of homiletics class was in Antioch. It wasn't Paul's Antioch. It was Antioch, California. And I had a classmate. That was her main church, her, her home church. And after I gave my sermon, she came up to me. And she said, Ray, that was the most biblical sermon I've ever heard. And right away, the ego in me was going, Woo! And then she continued and said, because you preached in fear and trembling. Okay, I got it. I had some work to do. And even though I finally preached hundreds of sermons and taught thousands of lessons, there are still times I stumble on words and do things a little incorrectly, but it was really God's process of getting me to where he wanted to be by doing it that I really discovered what my gift was and was able to function the way he wanted me to function. For you, it's the same thing. If you don't know what your gift is, you know, you could say, God... I don't know what it is. James tells us, hey, if we, we lack wisdom, ask God who gives all generously and without reproach. And then sometimes it's like, I'm going to step into it. I'm going to try this. And even if it doesn't work kind of the first time, I might give it a second try. I, I really want to discover where God wants me to be. Now, after four or five or six times, and somebody says, I, I, excuse me, maybe it's time for you to try something else. Okay, then it's time for that. But God will show you where you need to be and how you make the body of Christ more effective for his kingdom and what he wants to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that we are not left alone in the dark, mumbling and doing crazy things because you have restored to us our minds and you have shown us the way. And we're so grateful, God, because we know on our own we would never have gotten there, but you did it for us through the sacrifice of your son. And we ask now, God, that, that you build us together, individually and together, God, as the body of Christ, so that this church can reach out to our community to be that light, that shining example, so that you will have whatever it is, God, that you want us to be, and that we can reach those in our inner circle and those in our community. We pray in Christ's name.